From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on February 1st, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 27th episode of Matters Microbial. I'm very, very grateful to all of you who watch and or listen to this podcast. First, a fabulous member of my Wunderkammer that I see every day in my little laboratory, it's a famous quote from Charles Darwin, but I am very poorly today and very stupid and I hate everybody and everything. One lives only to make blunders. When I have bad days and doubt myself, I remind myself that even Chucky e. D had bad days. This wonderful plaque was a gift from the wonderful Michael Bame at Harvard University. I visited his lab and learned about megaplates and antibiotic resistance there. Soon after I returned home, I received this great gift. Thank you, Michael. The second week of my introductory biology course and lab here at the University of Puget Sound continues. To learn more about microbiological techniques, the students saw the results of the swabs of their reusable water bottles. Here's a nice summary of nine such plates, some with a great deal of growth and some with little. And this swab plate looked like a wonderful world of microbes. The next step is for these students to streak out two candidates for isolation and identification of each student's water bottle buddies. The students were also able to explore the intersection of art and science and creativity. I had them paint on very large petri dishes with luminous photobacterium. After incubation overnight, I photographed the results. Some students were quite simple. That's fine. That would have been me. But here is one Lux masterpiece in the style of what I can only say is Peter Max. And here's another arresting Lux portrait of the cartoon character of the Joker. I so enjoy encouraging this kind of creativity in my students. And it's important to really emphasize the connection between science and art. My own path through science was complex. I was a first generation student and raised in lower, lower middle class environments. A career in science seemed strange to everyone around whom I was raised, and in particular, my parents. I believe that science should be for everyone, and I always have. I also believe that different faces, voices, and perspectives are vital to keep, students, to keep science moving and improving and becoming more humane with time. We really do learn more through perspective. There is a saying in politics about having a big tent with many people having different ideas and backgrounds working together. In microbiology, then, perhaps we need a big petri dish where everyone can feel supported and valued. I believe, again, that we all benefit when we do so. So, as you can imagine, it's such a pleasure to introduce Dr. Sue Ishak of the University of Maine. She has done some fabulous microbiome research in a variety of contexts, and will tell us a bit about one project from her lab involving broccoli and the microbiome. But perhaps more to the point, Sue has promoted social equity and microbiology as goals and worked hard to make these ideas important parts of our developing field. Welcome to our Quality Quorum today, Sue. It's so great to see you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm really excited to be here to share some of the research that I've been doing, to share a little bit of my journey. Um, long time listener, first time podcaster. So, yeah. Well, I'm so glad to see you here today. And if you don't mind, I looked over your website and I will make a link to this website. First off, what a great website. It's so clear. I'm, I'm both jealous and inspired having seen it. And one of the things that struck me as I went over it is the variety of different areas of the microbiome you've worked in. Could you talk a little bit about that with us? Absolutely. So that, that website has been a, a labor of love for almost eight years now. I started it when I was a postdoc 
when I felt like I needed a little bit more of a presence so that while I was applying for jobs and to help me share my science, people would have one place to go. Um, I'm also, I am now on a lot of social medias, but your time runs short and having a centralized website that connects to a lot of these places can help. So back when I started this as a postdoc, I was actually working on animal microbiomes and bioinformatics. So I was running a lot of different data analyses for different projects in the lab. Um, and shortly after that, my funding ran out <laughs> unexpectedly, which sometimes happens when you're soft money funded in academia. Um, and luckily enough, I was already working with some researchers who were um, a working on wheat ecology in Montana. They were looking at climate change and they wanted to add microbial ecology from the soil onto it. And so um, for about a year and a half, I rebranded myself as a soil microbial ecologist while I was out there. Um, unfortunately, that was also soft money funded and that ran out faster than I expected. Um, then after that, I went to the University of Oregon to work in the Biology and Built Environment Center, where I rebranded myself again as an indoor microbiologist, and that ran out of money again. And so now I've been here um, at the University of Maine. Uh, so I, I basically took four left turns and ended up back in animal microbiology that has sort of expanded into to human microbiology here and there. Uh, but yeah. It's been a it's been a nice four and a half years here. Isn't that an amazing level of resilience? I mean, I, I, I know exactly how that feels. You know, you, you get knocked down, you get back up again like that. But look how look how it's worked out. Thank you. It um, I sort of always tell people that I'm, I'm retroactively successful because at the time <laughs> it's very stressful. You're reading a lot of papers, you're learning new things, you're recreating your social and professional networks. It's a lot of work. And um, now that I'm, I'm here at UMaine, you know, I do work on animal microbiomes, but there's no way to separate that from animal biology and the environment that they're in. And if you're working with humans, there's all of these social factors and constraints and things. Um, and so it's sort of like coalesced really nicely into um, sort of this One Health perspective, if that's something that people are familiar with, where you're looking at microorganisms, macroorganisms, and then the ecosystems that they're in. You know, there's there's a saying that I tell students a lot. It, it's it's a quote from that awful Frank Sinatra booze booze soaked smoking cigarette thing, where Dean Martin said, "It's Frank's world. We just live in it." And I would argue it's a microbial world, and we just live in it, which I think is a hundred percent true. And and that's how I got called a microbial centrist is because I always bring that up, and I'm I'm so glad to speak to a fellow fellow believer. Absolutely. Um, usually when I'm talking to people about gut microbiomes, if they're not already microbiome scientists, they usually want to wash their hands after talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remind them that microbes were here far longer than we have been, and they'll be here once we're gone. And so, yeah, we, we don't need to stress out about it. We just need to understand how our lives are impacted by them. One of the first buttons that I made to promote microbiology said first evolved, last extinct, because that's the truth. And, yeah. w and, and when the students flip out about their water bottles, I just smile to myself because they're carrying much more of a biofilm on their <laughs> teeth and, and, and they're not res responding to that. I don't tell them they're four layers deep on their hands of microbes so that when they're holding hands, so are the microbes. And I don't say that to be gross. It's like we're swimming through a sea of it all the time. And that's what makes this the kinds of things that you do so interesting. It's, it's like we're all in this immense ecology that we're unaware of. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of like trying to track, um, I'd say, a million needles in 10 million haystacks at the same yes. time. But it's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, there's no feeling I, in, in certainly even in my field, even what I, what I do at in the, the level I do with undergraduates. You know, I'll see stuff that no one's reported before, and there's no feeling for a student like that, well, and also for me, uh, than possible. It's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Absolutely. Do, yeah. Go ahead. So would, you, <laughs> so would you like to tell us a little bit about perhaps the broccoli project? Because uh, Lord knows I don't care for broccoli, and this will be good information for my wife to give me a bad time. I totally would. So I, I work on a ton of different projects all of the time. And the Broccoli Project has been 
um, one of the most rewarding over the last few years, and it's now taken up most of my time. So um, usually I go on and on about broccoli whenever people let me. Um, so when I started at the University of Maine as a very new assistant professor, um, Generally, when you do this, people want to come meet you and talk about you and talk about some research. And so one of the researchers who did that initially, her name's Nian Yan Li. Um, at the time, she was an associate professor um, at a nearby university. She has since in those few years um, briefly been a professor at University of Maine, and she's now just transitioned to um, SUNY Binghamton to uh, mm -hmm. uh, another position. Um, and so she and her husband had been working on the bioactive components of broccoli and broccoli sprouts, and in particular, this one compound called glucoraphanin that we can't do anything with, right? So you can eat all the broccoli, all the broccoli sprouts you want, and um, our cells can't do anything with it. But what's really fascinating about this particular compound is that if you were to eat raw broccoli, and in particular raw broccoli sprouts, where it's really, really concentrated, there's this enzyme that's already in that broccoli plant. And once you start chewing it or chopping it up, it gets mixed together with that compound. You shake up your little cocktail, and it creates this other compound called sulforaphane. Now, there's been decades of research into sulforaphane, and it's there in the plant to ward off insect predators. But because biology is so weird, it acts as an anti-inflammatory in humans and mice and other mammals. Yeah. So if you eat raw broccoli or raw broccoli sprouts, like you'll get this sulforaphane and you'll absorb it in your mouth and your stomach and it'll act systemically. And that's that's great. But um, what Yan Yan uh, had been working on was different preparations of broccoli sprouts. So whether you're steaming them over low heat, steaming them over high heat, and doing different things to inactivate some of those enzymes, you can get rid of all the broccoli enzymes, which means that you'll keep that precursor in your broccoli sprouts that we can't do anything with. You'll eat it. It'll go all the way into your gut and into your intestines. And if you're lucky, some of the bacteria that are in your colon will do that transformation for you right in your intestines. And what is really exciting about that is that we can use this as a model for resolving inflammation in inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and so we've, we've been working on different diet preparations in mice and different mouse models of inflammatory bowel disease that mimic either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And we, um, we can uh, enthusiastically say that we've resolved inflammatory bowel disease in mice, which is a problem entirely of our own making. Um, but we, we have really compelling evidence that we can translate this into humans and start formulating diet recommendations for people. And so obviously humans are so complicated. <laughs> um, so we, we've got a long ways to go to get there, but that's sort of the highlights of that. That is just an amazing story. Can I make two comments? Absolutely. So the first is I often run into people that don't appreciate how basic research can have practical benefits. And so even when you're talking about doing this work in mice, you know, there are people who aren't, li I call them the um, too long didn't read crowd. And, and, and they're everywhere because there's so much stuff out there. I'm not being critical. It's really hard. But notice how this transformed into something that could be studied to help human situations. I often brag that I haven't done anything ever in my research career that benefits humanity. But see, you can say that you have. And, and that's what's really wonderful. Perhaps you expected it. But if you didn't, that's also cool. I mean, we run the spectrum of things that we know will work in people. We're running a diet study right now, all the way back to just trying to understand which genes are involved in this on that bacteria. And I think sometimes we see science as this really settled thing, or we see all of the exciting outputs, and we don't really appreciate that it's more like skipping stones. There are so many gaps in our knowledge, even with things like we've known since Literally, we started cooking food over a fire, that cooking food <laughs> changes the nutritional uh, components of it, it changes the biochemistry of it. And so in that regard, we're, we're 
covering things that we've known for thousands and thousands of years, but in a totally new way. And so to anybody out there that's like, oh, all the cool things have been done. That's definitely not the case. No, and that's that's what I think is really important to emphasize people watching and listening about this, because it's very typical to have students say that they want to do things that, quote, help people. And you just can't tell is is the point. So finding what you love to do and and can study is is really that's what makes for for me science such a great profession. The other thing that I wanted to say is I've often heard and I want you to correct or reassure me that sometimes when people make sprouts in particular, that's not a good thing to consume because they're often associated with potentially harmful bacteria like salmonella. Yeah, so that um, has been true in the past and is getting less true. So the oh, reason good. that people are concerned with a lot of different sprouts, regardless of what plant it comes from, is because they're about 10 days old, they're really, really tiny. And so when you're harvesting them, you do pick up a lot of dirt and there's the potential for microbial growth. So anytime you buy sprouts, fresh sprouts in the grocery store, they've got a really short shelf life. Um, and if you leave them out, you'll find out why pretty quickly. Um, so that is a potential for concern. However, um, our food processing, our food safety has come a long way. And there are actually a lot of places where you can buy the seed bed itself. Um, so you just add water, it reduces any soil contamination. Um, and certainly for the purposes of our study, if you're steaming the sprouts, um, you're probably also going to be killing off at least some of those bacteria that are there. So it makes it quite a bit safer to consume. So Sue, you've, you've told us a little bit about the benefits of broccoli sprouts, but I'm a little concerned because, you know, I like broccoli sprouts, but what about the grown broccoli heads themselves? Are there any benefit to those? Of course, yeah. So for the sprouts, because they're very immature, they're about 10 days old, they happen to have a high concentration of that precursor that we're interested in, glucoraphin in it. It's really, really high because, again, you want to make sure that plants wants to make sure that that sprout reaches maturity. And so it's concentrated to ward off a lot of insects. So as that broccoli matures and it grows larger, all of that initial glucoraphanin is still there, but now it's spread out. And so you would have to eat so much more broccoli to get the same volume of glucoraphanin. And so usually when we're talking about therapeutic benefits, we talk about sprouts rather than that. The other small issue is that a lot of um, broccoli strains that are on the market today have actually been bred to be sweeter and to taste nicer. So many of them have actually selected against some of those sulfur-containing plant secondary compounds, which don't taste very good to some people, but are actually the really healthy ones. And so depending on what you're looking for um, or what you have available at your supermarket, you might not actually have broccoli mature that is very high in glucoraphanin. So we tend to recommend the sprouts. I used to so love having fresh sprouts on a sandwich. And maybe that time will come again. Yeah, for sure. But hey, steaming is is just as good for your gut. Okay, so I'm I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. <laughs> yeah, I've given you your homework now. Um, yeah. I am I am not currently funded by the broccoli sprout industry. If you are listening um, and you would like to endorse me or pay for any of my research, please give me a call. We would love more research funding. <laughs> I I once once was talking about a result at at a meeting uh, that was really interesting and you know I don't have funding for a lot of stuff and this person said well why haven't you done x y or z and they weren't being aggressive with me or anything and I just walked up and I took out my wallet and I said would you care to contribute and everyone laughed so that was pretty good yeah but, for sure <laughs> funding holds a lot of us back so being the kind of person I am, Sue, sometimes to avoid nasty, crunchy vegetables, I'll want to take supplements. And it occurs to me that I've heard of some of these broccoli extract supplements, and I believe they're the ones that contain sulforamine. Is that correct? So for And is thing, there any yeah. benefit to this? Yeah. So for my research, we are really interested in the whole food aspect because there are other compounds or other benefits to eating fiber or that broccoli sprout or even that whole broccoli or really any cruciferous vegetables are, are pretty good. Um, but we fully understand that, you know, some people 
with certain ailments or certain gut conditions or even, you know, children. There are lots of circumstances where you can't eat that whole broccoli sprout. We get that. Um, and so there are supplements out there that either contain sulforaphane, which is that anti-inflammatory, or the precursor, glucoraphanin. Sometimes they'll also contain the enzyme to help do it for you, or you'll rely on that gut. So sulforaphane so tends to be um, really unstable. That's one of the reasons why it's such a good anti-inflammatory because it loves other chemicals and wants to react to them. So a lot of those supplements um, might not be very useful for very long just because of that. And we know that anytime you're ingesting any food or supplements that are high in sulforaphane, you're going to absorb it in your mouth or your stomach, and it's not going to reach to your gut anyway. And so there are tons of cancer studies that show the benefits of eating high dietary sulforaphane that, uh, where it goes systemically and it's great. If you're specifically looking to get those benefits in your gut, you're going to want to eat the vegetables, or you're going to want to have something with glucoraphanin so that your gut microbes can do the work for you. And glucoraphanin is very um, stable, so uh, it works great in most products. What a great project. And what I liked in particular when I when I looked at the different projects that you had, and by the way, folks, do go over this website. Not only is it well-constructed, but everything is put out at different levels for different levels of expertise that the reader has. So you're to be congratulated for that. I, I'm you. very impressed. But what I noticed is that you spent a lot of time showing the different people that were involved in the research, which I think is really important. Often people think of science as like this, this, this big hierarchy, and we even get it when we have the term PI, principal investigator, right? But it's actually a cooperative, collaborative situation. Yeah, for sure. So um, on the broccoli sprout project in particular, we have an entire page dedicated to that research because there are so many projects and because it's a huge team of people. So we've got um, actually about six collaborators working on different projects, not all of whom are currently represented on that page. We've had uh, nearly 10 graduate students, six of whom are currently still in my lab. We've had, I think we just got to, um, a dozen maybe undergraduates. We have uh, several undergraduates rolling through every semester. So um, I have to check my totals again, but it, it's been a huge project. And so um, I absolutely could not have done any of this myself, um, for sure. I certainly couldn't have done it even within my own lab. It's really relied on our collaborators. And in particular, it's relied on interdisciplinary collaboration because we're bringing together biochemistry, microbiology, microbial ecology, bioinformatics, histology, mouse care, all of these different things that take months to learn and years to, to be excel in. And it's not something that you can create first day. And so um, usually when I have a platform, I'm also advocating for research funding and specifically for longer term trainee positions because it takes ages to, to gain that expertise. And my lab can't function without every single amazing person in it. And the institutional memory that has to be left behind as well. Um, my own situation with undergraduates, about the time that they've learned really important skills and feel comfortable with them, it's time to graduate. And, and it's similar sorts of situations at all different levels in the academic um, ecosystem for life. I was going to say hierarchy. I have to break myself of that uh, in the academic ecosystem. And it's it's really true. Um, I don't have a good solution for it. I think a lot of folks of a certain age remember when when people could just publish a paper with two authors. And that's generally the graduate student in the PI who did very little other than edit the paper. But this has changed. So it's become more collaborative. And in a lot of ways, I think that's more humane. For sure. I've published um, actually quite a few papers now with like 10 to 35 authors on it. Um, as, you, as you've referred to before, I really enjoy working in a big Petri dish. Yeah. I, and I think that's, I wish there was a beautiful image of that, but I so worry about how to represent things for the dish. So we can just say a big Petri dish instead of a big tent. And I think that'll put the point across, but that would be a great pin. Um, to, I'll think about that. So I really like this idea a lot. And this kind of segues, I think, into your second interest. Well, you don't just have two. You have about a gazillion. 
<laughs> my second may, biggest, let's say. Yeah. And, and may I say parenthetically, it's really important to remember that most of old science, and I do mean old, is highly reductionist because that worked for asking and answering specific questions, but that's not really how nature works. For example, as I tell people all the time, a Petri dish or a 2059 tube does not represent nature, nor does lysogeny broth. So, um, or when people were studying biofilms, Sue, uh, and I would say to them, how can you know what's going on since biofilms are multi-species, sometimes multi-kingdom? And they would say to me, okay, so I put two members in the biofilm and studied that. Well, I think the truth is we lack the tools, the computing power and the tools to do that. So I really like the fact that we can bring things together the way we have. And it's not a surprise. The very genesis of molecular biology were a bunch of quantum physicists that moved to biology, like Max Delbrich and, and Sal Luria, people like that. It made a big difference. And so, as I alluded to before, the second thing that I think you're, if you don't mind my saying so, very well known for is your commitment to improving accessibility and diversity within microbiology. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, earlier in the podcast, we were talking about how microbes are everywhere and they connect us. And that's kind of the basis impact statement for the microbes and social equity working group. Um, so the, the long journey saga version of that is that while I was at the University of Oregon, I was in a research department that um, brought together computational biologists, microbial ecologists, and also architects. So we were having lots of discussions about how um, city designs can impact your food access or how building designs really impact your exposure to different microbial communities inside that built environment. And so um, because my background at land grant universities and in agricultural departments was heavily tied into um, research and extension activities or outreach activities or basically sharing my science with people who are gonna be impacted, um, I would have these conversations explaining that or explaining, you know, food justice and gut microbiome mm -hmm. issues. And so we would come together over these ideas of spatial justice and food, right? And so um, while I was at the University of Oregon, my funding ran out and all of a sudden I found myself in financial need and with free time. So I proposed this as a course to the Honors College there titled Microbes and Social Equity. So uh, for three weeks in the summer, I taught um, mostly humanities students at the undergraduate level and a couple of biology students about microbial ecology and how um, different things in human lives tend to impact the microbes that we're exposed to. So food access again is, is a big one. Um, uh, prenatal, postnatal, and also vaginal care is also a huge one. Access to breastfeeding resources, stuff like that. Uh, and then for that last week, we compiled all of their essays that they wrote into one massive manifesto that was over 10,000 words, which honestly no one was going to publish as it was. So uh, myself and a few of the other um, guest speaker researchers in that class, we continued to work on it and carve it down a little bit, refine it into the essay that was eventually published a few months later in PLOS Biology under framing the discussion of microbes and social equity. And so um, during that time, I had uh, transitioned to my current position here at the University of Maine. I was back in an agricultural department. I was all set to work on animal microbiomes again. And so I, I honestly thought that, that would be the end of it. Um, and I was um, amazingly surprised when people started emailing me and asking me what was next, saying that they had been doing something similar, saying that they were looking for basically a community of researchers. And so like any good academic, I scheduled a meeting. Uh, so <laughs> a few dozen of us met over Zoom and chatted about just like-minded ideas. Um, and then people kept wanting to meet and more people kept joining. And so four years later, we're an international group. We've got just over 300 members from uh, at least 22 countries. We've got um, undergraduates all the way to MRI professors, and we also like span the discipline. So um, everything from architecture to zoology and everything in between. And so it's created this like amazingly diverse on every metric group that allows us to learn from each other. 
And so we're all interested basically in, in human health and ecosystem health and how that connects to microbes. And so we come at it in different ways. Um, and it's allowed us to sort of share our information, put pieces together that we wouldn't be able to and spark a lot of collaborations between um, microbial ecologists or people on sort of the biology side with people on the humanity side that have these particular expertise in anthropology or geography or, or all sorts mm -hmm. of things. And so um, it's, we, we now host um, a regular speaker series. We've host symposia and special conference sessions. Um, we have a special uh, collection going in the M systems journal. And of course, all of our researchers have a thriving um, research portfolio of their own. So they've done work all over the place. So, uh, it's it's probably been like one of the most meaningful things I've ever done for sure, and not something that I ever would have predicted myself doing. Um, so uh, I can I can expand more on how I got into science, but um, I used to hate public speaking, and <laughs> the thought of leading an international group or being on a podcast um, used to you know make me run and hide. And so um, helping this group become what it is has really helped me develop my um, my voice and my professional capacity. You know, Sue, this is a wonderful example of something that I've been saying for a long time. And, and I know that I sound flippant a lot, but this is actually really important. A lot of times the way that ideas change go through three phases. The first is, well, that's a really silly idea. The second is, well, it might work a little bit, but it's not relevant. And the third level is, I said it was a good idea all along. And what I'd like to say about what you're doing is that there are a whole bunch of, of people whom I'm going to call the doctor knows in the sense that they aren't interested in things and they shut down and they look for the reasons it won't work. I'm not going to be nasty about it because I understand how that happens. But you have the energy of activation to bring these things together in this kind of chemical reaction to bring things together and look at the impact that you've had. And, 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 and the only thing I worry about is sometimes there's a fourth level, which is, and I came up with the idea first, but I'm not going to let that happen because you made this happen. And there's a good paper trail that shows that. And I think you're to be lauded for it. Thank you. Um, it's, it's very much been like a, a sort of we instead of a me operation. And mm -hmm. certainly my ideas were formulated based off of decades of other research. So while I was mm -hmm. um, looking for resources for this particular class and pulling things together, um, there wasn't one source that brought all of these ideas together. I spent quite a bit of time trying to draw these stories together. And so I think one of the things that I've added to this is a level of organization or just creating that space for other people to bring their ideas. And so um, certainly I'm not the first person to have the idea that microbes are important to our well-being and that we should maybe change social policy for sure. Um, I think I definitely came up with the best hashtag, but um, yeah, I, I think that we can get so much further when we work together. And sometimes we just need that peer learning group and that place to just bounce ideas off of each other. I think there's an African proverb about that that I've heard that if you want to go far, go together. And and I think that that's and I think that to some degree, and this might be a Western cultural issue and also, well, I guess that includes Europe. This idea of one person spearheading things is, is very common. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist in other cultures, but I do think that many of us after the Industrial Revolution thought that way. But in fact, group behaviors sometimes are not good, of course, but they can also be good in this sense. So it perhaps a good term for what you've done is you've been a facilitator. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I think that, and I think that that's, that's a wonderful thing. Incidentally, I am going to put lots of links to this podcast in the show notes, and um, I'm going to go ahead and go through your um, website for different things. And if you don't mind, I'll shoot you an email to make sure I've gotten everything. So that it's it looks good because I think that this could be a resource for other people who are are watching or listening. 
Yes, please. Uh, there's a whole section of my website that has previously been hosting microbes and social equity things. We're migrating that to a standalone website to make it a little bit easier to, for people to find resources. But almost all of the presentations that we've given have been recorded and are available for people to watch. It's got links to all of the publications. Um, we just created our very own board of directors, which was, we're really excited about. And so this year we're hoping to compile a lot more resources for the community, like best practices, um, shared teaching materials, things like that. Oh, I think it's it's wonderful. Do you have some success stories to share about this process or things that really struck you as being wonderful? <laughs> um, how many more hours of this do podcast? You have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I would say the the thing that's been most um, validating to me is hearing people who have appreciated this group for giving them a voice or a place to talk about this because you're you're right often this is this idea has been sidelined or it's seen as sort of like yeah, okay but i'm not sure how you would show that mechanistically or we get lukewarm um receptions occasionally and so i've i've heard from a lot of people within the group that they this idea simply doesn't fly at their workplace and it's not something that they can focus on or spend time on and it's seen as as a broader impact it's seen as not critical to the work um, and sort of we argue that you you literally can't do any research on human microbiomes without understanding the context of their life. And you honestly can't do that without understanding the context of the, the policies that are controlling their life or controlling their access. And so, um, you know, if I'm doing animal microbiome research and I'm describing their gut microbiome, I have to be detailed. I have to describe as many things as possible. And I have to try and understand the context of what's going on. And that's expected of me as a researcher. And so we're we're trying to bring this um, into everyone's workplace and into the, the sort of social um, zeitgeist, if you will, that we do as human microbiome researchers need to start thinking about all of these different aspects. And even if we're not responsible for each part of that alone, right? Like that siloed silence or science, we can um, find our community, we can network with more people, and we can enrich our science and enrich ourselves as professionals by working together on a lot of these concepts. In, in my dealings with you, uh, and this is not a particular statement about any particular interaction, it's just my, my read on things. One of the problems that some people might have is feeling that they themselves don't share particular identity with particular groups, and they feel uncomfortable um, getting involved with that. And what I have found is that if you make the effort to talk to people, they will be patient. And I want to emphasize that patient if you stumble over things. Certainly, you have been patient with me. Secondly, I think that it's a matter of growth and, and personal growth. Things change with time. And I can't see any world at all where we don't bring in lots of different people to an air, to a particular discipline. And there are lots of different ways that you can do it. Other people have been doing it in lots of ways, and we need to talk about it. And that's why you have a, a really great and accessible program for this. I appreciate that. Yeah, like I, I definitely didn't start out this way. I didn't start out thinking about microbiomes and social contexts in this way. You know, I certainly don't didn't have the academic training to get to here because that wasn't my goal. Um, but just like so many microbiome scientists, I've had to switch fields so many times or switch interests. And so many of us find ourselves um, human or human adjacent. And so we need to get better at this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so again, like, you know, we we want to make it accessible for people to come in and learn something because we fully appreciate that most of us don't have uh, anthropological training to do human microbiome research, and we certainly don't have the time to get a second PhD. Oh yes, and and so when I hear about, and I'll give you an example, when I know of people that will have a program where they will ask their undergraduate students to give fecal samples uh, and half the class is taking this supplement and half the class is doing this. I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I know I couldn't get that approved by the institutional review board on my, on my campus. Um, and I'm not putting down the work. What I am saying is that I don't know how you take that data 
and are able to analyze it because of the diversity we see within humans. Yeah, we, as humans and as researchers, we're, we're taught to be really reductionist. We're taught to simplify things and we just love binaries. I, I think it's just because human bodies are symmetrical. We love binaries and that is not the case for literally anything, even ourselves, right? Like binaries are silly. Um, and so, um, I, I, I try to remind people with human microbiomes that the microbiome will tell you everything and nothing, right? Like it's all about context. And if you don't have the context or if you don't have specific research questions to ask, you might not learn anything. Um, and so I, I tend to go into my projects with both specific hypotheses and specific research questions. And then also just a I'm going to see what happens type of attitude, right? Like I really love unconstrained ordinations for anyone that looked at any of my papers. Um, I, I go in without hypotheses and just try to see if I see any patterns. And so when I'm sort of working with human microbiome stuff, um, you know, I never have large enough projects where I get huge groups or I've got multiple treatment groups. And so I, I probably won't know 95% of what's going on in those microbiomes and why they're there. But I always come in with specific research questions so that I can at least say, based off of these few bacteria that we're interested, based off of these few metrics, are we changing anything or not? Um, I specifically try not to do any student-based microbiome research, uh, not only in my, my teaching because of lack of funds, but for my human um, diet trial research, we specifically uh, advertised off campus. We tried not to recruit students, not because they're not meaningful, but because it adds a layer to that power dynamic that I didn't want to introduce. And so um, as, as researchers, we have a lot of responsibility about how we treat our study participants, how we present information to them, and how we act during the study and after that. And so I take that very seriously. Um, our, our broccoli project, we spent months reworking our, um, our consent materials, our instruction materials to make them more accessible, to add pictures and to help people find that information because sometimes it's, you know, okay, it's there on a page, but it's three pages of dense text and no one's going to read that, right? Um, it's very, it's very legally. So we, we spent a lot of time doing that. We spent a lot of time creating a, um, a recipe book for people in our study. And we spent a lot of time um, and are still spending a lot of time working on individualized reports for every single one of our participants so that they can see that information. Um, I don't want to say in real time because we are so slow about it, but every few months they get an update with a little bit more information and what we think is happening. And so um, I didn't want to add students into this because it is a very close knit campus at UMaine. I do have a lot of one-on-one -on -one student interactions and I want to preserve that capacity for them to come into my office and tell me things that they can't tell anybody else without worrying that it's going to be weird because they're also going to hand me a fecal sample later. Right. Like it's too complicated. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No. And, 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 and it's something when I've had this discussion with people, I, I will have some folks kind of roll their eyes at this, but I've always viewed myself as like a giant goofball because I am. And I want to be microbiology's giant goofball. That's true. But that is me seriously. But what I have found is that my perception of myself doesn't matter. Uh, so I can say, why would a student be afraid to ask me a particular question or have a particular conversation with me? The fact that I don't think they should feel worried about it. Also, the fact that I would never, ever harm another person that I'm working with. None of that matters. It's their perception. And, and, one can say that that's not accurate. You should stick with that, but it is what it is. And so I want to protect their privacy. I want to protect their level of comfort. I, you know, when I say their level of comfort, some people, again, roll, there's a lot of eye rolling in my life. I have to be honest with you, but I do think I want people to feel secure and, and I want them to feel supported. And, and so like when I take off the silly hat, literally, um, I can sometimes do that. But the important thing is exactly what you're saying, not necessarily separating, but really watching your borders. Yeah, I think it comes down to um, time and how long it takes to build trust. So 
in my courses I teach on a semester base, I've got 15 weeks to get them to trust me. And for some of those classes and some of the assignments that I'm asking them to do, it takes most of that time for them to learn that they can say what they want to say and, and try new things mm -hmm. and fail at them and it'll still be okay. But I don't have that for advisees that I might see for 15 minutes. And I certainly don't have that for um, people who are entering my study because I see them for about 30 minutes and that's when they decide if they're going to participate or not. And I, I need them to feel comfortable being honest with me because stuff happens, right? Like people get sick, people might start taking antibiotics, people might hate the broccoli sprouts, they might do weird things, right? Like I need them to just be comfortable telling me when they can't participate in my study rather than right. just feeling like they have to drop out and never show their face again. So I very much wanted this to be a back and forth. And because of that, we've learned some amazing things from our participants that we otherwise wouldn't have gotten with just like a, a basic survey of demographic information. And it's not the kind of thing you can necessarily talk about because of issues like FERPA but is there some kind of observation that you could share that was unexpected? Uh, from my my students are from the broccoli sprouts. I was I was mentioning from the students because we were talking about this issue of building trust, and so maybe yeah. it's not something that we should talk about. Um, I I can't give any details, obviously, but um, I think in general, as as instructors, we see very little of our students, and we see them in a very specific format, and that format is in class where they've paid us to be there and we give them things to do and they're supposed to do them. And usually like three quarters of the way through the semester and uh, attendance bottoms out. Sometimes you find yourself in near empty classrooms, people are late in assignments and it almost feels like they've all given up. And often instructors feel like, oh, I must be doing something wrong. I have to be harder on them. You know, they're, they're playing me. And that is almost never the case, right? Like I'm sure a few students are taking advantage of, of lax policies, but whatever. But most of our students here at UMaine, they have complicated lives. Like they've got kids, they've got care responsibilities. Some of them commute over an hour. They've got farm chores at three in the morning, right? Like sometimes after the semester and after grades are in, students will come to me and say, thank you for your letting me turn things in after deadlines and not taking points off because of X, Y, Z. And um, every time I'm just like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that was mm -hmm. a, a immense challenge in your life. I am so impressed that you managed to finish this class at all. Thank you for telling me this because, you know, I started to doubt myself and to doubt my policies halfway through. And every, every other instructor, every peer in my life is telling me that I need to be harder on them. And every student in my life is thanking me for um, for just understanding that life is complicated. So, yeah, for anyone who who gets into microbiology um, or in academia, eventually you end up teaching students and there's a real temptation to just make it very difficult for them. But that's actually not what our job is. My our job is no. to bring them this information and assess how they did at learning. That's it. It's not a moral judgment on whether they belong there. It's not whether they can succeed in this field forever. It's, it's literally just to assess how they found that information. You know, it's very interesting. I, I have uh, lapel pins I wear that say you are so much more than a grade um, that, you know, to be a kind human, all these kinds of things. And I think what it comes back to is we need to be, we need to accept that we're human. And that means fraught with mistakes. That's, that's who we are. But we also need to be more humane. And that's one thing that I've learned from it. And, and so as I learned to work with students over all these years, that's that you want to be able to treat them as individuals, but you simply can't. And but if they if they take the time to come and chat with you and talk with you, you can sometimes develop that level of trust, which certainly changed my life when I was in college because I was a lost soul. So I just try to pay it forward in that regard. Yeah, I think it it helps to um, learn how to have compassion and to have accessible policies without getting that feedback from students, because sometimes yes. they won't thank you for months or you won't know if it's working until later. And sometimes of them never thank you. Right. Like that's their prerogative. So you have to learn how right. to be um, fair and unbiased and to really focus on what is what do they actually need to learn out of this class and just filter out all of the noise. 
it's it's really an experience. I think I've I've learned more from my students than I've been able to teach them about being a better human. And and that's really because of communication. And and this brings us back to issues of representation, I think, because you look at my classes, they're relatively small um, by the standards probably you're used to. My largest class has 48. When I teach microbiology, I have 16 students, two laboratory sections of eight. So I get to know those students quite that well. That's a dream. <laughs> my, but, you know, anyone who says that that's easy, it's just a different form of difficulty. And then if you have 48 and three lab sections of 16, it's see, it's harder. Now, imagine where I went to school, UCLA, um, you, you know, where there was a fellow who went to grad school with me. We were both biology majors. We graduated the same year and we had never met one another. And 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 that's that's a big deal. So the reason I bring this up is issues of representation are important. And, and, you know, all of us in academia have lots of workshops about how to make people feel welcome and validated and all kinds of terminology. I always worry about it becoming too jargony when it just means listening and being a decent human being. I have a more profane way of putting it. A student taught me, but I'm not going to say it. Um, but it, it, in other words, just not being a bad person. How's that? Um <laughs> <laughs> you you get the idea. Yeah. So yeah. A, anyway, um, there's, there's this issue of representation. And I mean, I've had more than one person note that the majority of students who work in my laboratory happen to be women. It so happens that generally speaking, there are more women in my classes than men. And, and these are things that I think are self-selecting in some ways, depending on the institution. Now, if you go to things like engineering, you might see a bias in the other direction. And there are people who've dealt with that and dealt very well. And this is why the things that you're interested in are important, because science needs to be for everyone. And, and I have people roll their eyes about uh, but I, I believe it. Maybe I'm being too nicey-nicey Hallmark Cardish, but I really do believe it. But we have to make that happen. And that's the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've, um, where do I want to even start the sentence? Um, so I, I fully appreciate, right, that people come in with their personal perspectives, whatever they've gone through, and it can be really difficult to see from anyone else's perspective, even when you want to, right? Like even when you want to have empathy, it's just not how you grew up. And so it does take practice to learn how to see things from other people's perspective. Um, but you can sort of uh, get past those hamperings by having a more diverse audience to talk to and by getting feedback from more people. And so certainly when I'm, um, you know, I'm recruiting students or I'm putting out a call for people to join my lab, there are certain types of people that feel comfortable or think that they would have a place in my lab and there are certain people that don't. And so for my part, I try to make it welcoming to all. I do try to make it clear that anyone is welcome in my lab, um, but I fully appreciate that there are probably things that I'm missing, um, words that I'm using, phrases that I'm using, or maybe just even, you know, pictures of everybody in my lab makes it seem like that's the audience I want. And that's not necessarily true, but again, you know, I'm, I'm just me. I'm my perspective. And so I think for a lot of programs that say like, well, you know, we're not getting these students or these types of people don't want to work in this field. Um, that's not actually true. It's just that they maybe don't feel comfortable or they don't feel like they can make it where you are. And so I always encourage people to um, just reach out and get and get feedback. And sometimes it's as simple as extending invitations to people who clearly didn't think. So I, I teach a lot of um, research-based undergraduate classes, and there are students that go through this that have never been in research before, never thought that they would be a researcher. And so I understand that if I put out a call for students to join my lab, they're not gonna answer because they feel like, well, that's not what I wanna be, so it, it's not where I should go. And I specifically reach out to them and I say, hey, you did really well in this assignment. I think you would like the class. Do you want to come shadow in my lab and just check it out? And so for some of those programs, like sometimes it's just a little bit more conversation, a little bit more invitation and just reminding people that, no, in fact, they are 
they are welcome in your your program. Um, I you, yeah, go ahead. All I was going to say is you're absolutely right with these cure based laboratories. I mean, you're you're younger, <laughs> quite a bit younger than I am. I'm sad. Sadly, I'm getting old. But the important point is when I took lab classes, it was all kind of demonstrations, really. So these ideas of research-based undergraduate experiences or cures, as they're called, and they're all over the place now, can let the people taking the classes understand that they could do research. And, and that is one step that we can make as instructors to let them know that this is something, and, and you make an excellent point, to single someone out and say, you've got real skills here. That has an effect. Yeah, um, and, and I think it's helpful to remind all researchers, right? That like students don't usually know what our day to day is like. They don't really know what research is like. And even the students that have gone through microbiology, yeah, but they don't know what my microbiology is like, right? And so, um, you know, they they don't think that this is for them because they have no idea. And so that that is a nice segue into like how I got to where I am, um, because my career path for most of my life was very much based off of my impressions of careers and not the actual day to day. Okay. So, um, grab your popcorn. This is this whole story. So, um, I would say this started when I was 12 and I had my very first hamster named fidget. She was an amazing hamster. She would hang out on my shoulder, loved fidget. She was so great. Um, at, after a year or so, I got her a different cage that was metal. And so she injured herself. She dislocated her shoulder. Um, and of course it was like in the evening and 12 year old Sue is like, mom and dad, we need to take fidget to the emergency vet in all seriousness. Like we need to go to the emergency vet. And obviously my parents said, no, it is a hamster. What are they going to do? Um, and so for mom and dad who are probably listening to this podcast later, yes, I remember this. So I, I did what I could as a 12 year old that had no knowledge of palliative care and no um, internet or cable at the time um, to, to nurse her through, but she obviously didn't make it. And so, um, at 12 years old, I was like, I'm going to be a veterinarian. That's it. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And so no one could talk me out of that. Um, I took, uh, extra biology classes in high school. I took, I was lucky enough to, um, be able to take like summer programs at our local veterinary school. And so I was like, this is what I'm going to do. But I'd never actually worked in a vet's hospital. I had no appreciation for the day-to-day -day life. And I certainly didn't understand what um, it meant to be a veterinary student, because if you get into it, it it's very stressful, it's very difficult, um, and they are also notoriously underfunded. And so um, I got to my undergraduate program in uh, pre-vet. I met all the other pre-vet students, and I was like, nope, this is not for me. This is way too competitive. I'd have to give my life to this for no pay. This sounds awful. I'm not that type A person. Um, what about graduate school? And so, <laughs> so I laugh about it now for anyone that's ever gone through graduate school. Um, it's, it's the same. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted and I didn't know what graduate school was like and I didn't know what research was like. And so I, I took a bunch of different classes. I took like wildlife management. I took ocean ecology, um, all sorts of things. And I had this vague idea that I wanted to do conservation. And so as an undergraduate, I was in the honors program at the University of Vermont um, at the time. And uh, I, I did a summer project where I studied the behavior of two captive skunks um, with enrichments. And so I, I did an ethnography study and um, I shudder to think about the quality of that research now. But, you know, I did the best I could. I, it convinced me that research was something that I would be interested in doing day to day and even sitting for hours and hours at a time, writing down everything that two skunks did. Like if you can survive that, you're probably okay in research. So I was like, I'm going to go to graduate school. Um, unbeknownst to me, uh, there aren't very many programs in graduate research that involve conservation and many of them um, don't have a lot of funding. Right. And so I didn't have the money to self-fund myself, uh, self-fund through graduate school. I didn't mm -hmm. have the money to um, volunteer my entire time at a zoo waiting for one of these positions to open up. And so I, I applied to a lot of different programs. Um, unfortunately, that was uh, right after the 2008 financial crash. And so those repercussions were eventually felt in college budgets. And a lot of those programs had fewer students available or professors were, were saying that you know, funding had dried up a tiny bit. And so 
um, after after a couple of years of applying and getting some interviews, but but no offers, um, I eventually was like, okay, I actually have to um, get a job in research. And so for the three years after I graduated, I was ironically working as a tech in a veterinary hospital, which confirmed that I didn't want to be in veterinary medicine. Um, but while I was there, one of the vets, their spouse had just gotten a job as a lecturer back at University of Vermont and said, hey, there's a new department chair. They're renovating the farm. I'm sure there's research positions available. So I was like, awesome. I'm going to go talk to that person. Um, so I, I cold emailed him, who uh, Andre Denis, right, when he was the department chair of University of Vermont. And he said, well, I don't have any jobs, but have you ever considered graduate school? Like, <laughs> have I? <laughs> so we met for, for coffee and to talk about potential projects and what it would look like. And so at the time, um, he was cataloging the gut microbiomes in wild animals and specifically wild herbivores as a way to understand what microbes have um, gone missing in livestock animals because of domestication or because of management practices and to try and understand how we can maybe put some of those microbes back to improve digestion and increase animal production while sort of re reducing waste, right? And so uh, we eventually settled on my project, which was going to be to catalog the microbes in the rumen of the moose. So I worked on bacteria, um, archaea, uh, protozoa, and um, I didn't actually get to, to fungi because one of my collaborators was on leave for a few years. But, um, you know, I it was a lot of fun. And it wasn't really until those conversations that I thought of myself as a microbiologist. And some of that mm -hmm. was motivated by the idea of, okay, I can go to graduate school, I can gain these skills. I don't have to focus on that for the rest of my career, but it'll it'll get my foot in the door. Um, and so I, I always tell people, so like taking that part of my journey and then taking the other part of my journey where I, I kept getting laid off and having to rebrand myself as a different type of microbial ecologist, I always remind people that like, you should just try it. Like ask if you can shadow somebody's lab, sit in on some lab meetings, see what it's like, take a bunch of courses because you don't really know what that profession is going to be until yeah. you get there. And, and even within, you know, my microbiology lab, that's not going to be the same as any of the other microbiology labs on campus. And so don't define yourself by, by one experience in your life or by not being invited to things. Um, Cause I, my degree focused on microbiology, genetics and computer programming, which were three things that I actively avoided for my entire <laughs> education. Um, you know, I, I didn't think that was for me. I didn't have microbiology in high school, but we did have computer programming and there were, um, you know, there's maybe one or, or two girls in that class. Everyone else was mm -hmm. not. And I thought, well, it's not really for me. And nobody invited me to that class. Like I, it didn't even enter my brain that I might ever be a programmer. Um, and I'm technically still not a programmer, but I do quite a bit of, of DNA sequencing data analysis. And I do a lot with computer programming type things. And so, um, you know, I, in, in retrospect, like I wish I'd been bolder and tried things that I thought weren't for me or insisted that I should be there um, because it would have made my graduate work so much easier. That is an amazing tale. And what I like about it is it talks about barriers that people have, have, have perceived and that people have experienced. And there's a difference between those two things, of course. And the, the basic take home lesson seems to be you need to learn to trust yourself, trust your experience, and trust your feelings about it. And that's why the outreach that we do is so important. That's why trying to make sure that we have different different faces and different voices and experiences enriches everyone. Every time I use the word enrichment, I laugh, of course, being a microbiologist. <laughs> Just like when I say, keep me in the loop. That's funny, too, to a microbiologist. But I think that we've learned a lot from this particular program. And, and what I would like to do before we wind it up, is there one basic piece of advice? Well, you've given a lot of advice. Perhaps you don't want to <laughs> give any more. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity to have the last word, essentially. Oh, thank you. I love having the last word. Um, I should have prepared better for this. Okay, so I, I guess my, my three things are, are eat, eat your vegetables, right? Um, try new things and never feel like you, you don't belong. Um, all you have to do is ask for help, ask to be there, 
ask for some guidance and somebody is, is willing to show you the way. Oh, now that is really true. You don't really believe it initially, but it, it is true. It may not be the person you would like to support you, but you will find people to support you. I know that's been my experience and it sounds like it's been yours. I've had so, so many people help me along the way that I'm I'm honestly yeah. so grateful to. I wouldn't be here without the hundreds of, of people in my support network. I cannot agree more. It's like I've been picked up so many times that there must not be any seams left in my clothing. And and all you can do, you can thank them, if and you should, but you can pay it forward to the next people. Uh, and, and that's what's really important to me is to find ways to make things better if I can. And I have to tell you, Sue, and you know, I act silly a lot, but I mean this genuinely, how inspirational this session has been and how much I've learned from you during this session. And I want to thank you. Thank you so much. I honestly, I would have said the same about you, actually. I've, I've been sort of following your Twitter presence for so much longer than the, the time that we've known each other electronically. Um, your, your, your brand of humor, the way that you bring art and, and you know, little tardigrade shapes and everything um, into your class. And actually, I've been using uh, a very old video that you have of bionucleation and ice formation um, in my, my classes talking about host microbes for like years now. It's the best video. Oh, well, it's, it's very, it's very nice to, to hear you say that. So what I'd like to do is thank you again for participating and, uh, my very best wishes to your lab folks. Once again, do check out the show notes from this episode. You will not be sorry. And thanks so much, Sue. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. This has been Matters Microbial a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes, important show notes from today's episode can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin. And you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Sue Ishak is part of the School of Food and Agriculture at the University of Maine. Many, many thanks to David Renata for excellent editing and Reber Clark, as usual, for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum for today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.